one of the people that we really wanted to have, I've wanted to have for a long time, um, and he, he was actually on our stages much earlier at one of our smaller conferences, but when, when they were much smaller, um, is Evan Spiegel. I think there's no argument that this is probably the most exciting uh, entrepreneur this year, um, someone who's creating a platform um, not out of nothing. It's something that's really grown really quickly. Um, I just write backstage, the only people my sons have ever wanted to meet are Steve Jobs and Evan Spiegel and they just fell over themselves uh, meeting them. They use Snapchat all the time and love it, and it's a really fascinating phenomenon, and he's here to talk about it. So, Evan Spiegel. So, um, so we're thrilled to have you here. Um, I'm sorry for that attack by those, my children, um, but you're a rock star to them. Um, let's get started to talk about media companies, because this we were just talking about it just a second ago. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank you, thank you very yeah. much. Um, I'm sorry you didn't make an offer. Um, <laughs> but, but are you a media company? Like, let's talk about what a media company is now today, and what, a lot of things you're doing around hiring, uh, hiring a lot of, in the area, doing stories, doing all kinds of things. Talk about sort of broadly what you're up to on your platform around media. Uh, obviously, content's really important to our business. Um, and it's really one part of sort of the three businesses that comprise Snapchat. So if we take a step back and we look at what Snapchat is, it all starts with the camera. We have this really great, uh, basically, capture product. And we've worked really hard to evolve that. So it started with just a photo, just a snap. It evolved into video. We made this really simple mechanism where you can just press and hold on the screen, and it'll start recording a video. There are all sorts of editing tools too. So you can, you know, add text and make it crazy colors. Uh, you know, add filters, add filters based on where you are. Uh, so we worked really hard to evolve the camera, um, and then, kind of, to the left of the camera screen, really the app is kind of just three screens. Um, there's a communications business, and so that has chat and video calling, um, and obviously snaps, and being able to send pictures and, and videos back and forth. Um, and kind of the most recent addition, something we've focused a lot on the last year, uh, to your point, is our content business. And that's to the right of the camera. Um, and that's really comprised of stories, uh, live stories, and most recently our uh, Discover service. So we've worked really hard um, with, with Discover in particular to introduce an editorial perspective mm -hmm. to what was otherwise really the people's, people's perspectives. <laughs> um, and we added that editorial balance. And why? What are you, what are you aiming for? It's hard to tell. You're, you hired this new CNN reporter. You're trying to put, you put together stories yourself. What do you, are, you tr are you trying to create a new kind of media company? Or how do you, are you going to do more of that, create a new service, buy content companies? Whew. Any of those. Uh, <laughs> so, so hiring folks like Peter or even experimenting with making our own content is really about competency. So we kind of ran into this challenge where, um, you know, we built this stories product, which allowed you to tell your personal story. And then we built a live stories product, which means uh, that if you're at a, a big event and you're taking a, taking a snap and you're about to add it to your story, we give you an option to add it to a story that's shared by everyone that's at the event. Um, and that means it's kind of really cool, you know, you get 10,000 perspectives of an event instead of just 10 from television cameras or something like that. Um, but what happened sort of as that product evolved is that we realized while we were getting, you know, thousands of different perspectives from different people, um, we weren't getting, you know, kind of the editorial uh, perspective, kind of what was newsworthy to balance that out. And so we've really invested recently in, in really just trying to understand and get a little better at like what it means to be a journalist, what it means to build a platform for journalists. Um, and that's really where we are. We're super early, a couple, you know, six months maybe into, into Discover, and we're still just at a, at a place where we're trying to understand how we can be a great platform for publishers. So there are a lot of places in the world uh, particularly in Asia, where things started out as messaging services and really have become platforms for hundreds of different things you can do. You've begun to do that a little bit with the three things you mentioned and, and the latest one uh, in particular. Do you, do you see that for this generation and, and for this time, uh, it's time for a messaging service to evolve that way, and are you that messaging service? So I, I think the thing that you're, 
hitting on is that you know messaging is really the highest frequency behavior on a phone. <laughs> Makes a right. lot of sense. Um, but I think that a lot of you know a lot of companies have really worked on saying, okay, I have all these people visiting my service multiple times a day to talk to their friends. What other things can they do while maybe they're waiting for their friend to respond? Um, and that's definitely part of what makes our business uh, more interesting. Um, it means that we can show people you know content that they might uh, enjoy while they're waiting for their friend to respond. And for us, we've also tried to make it a part of the messaging process. Where hey, you know if you you know, if you're sending something as a message, maybe you also want to send it uh, to all your friends, or you want to broadcast it to all of your friends. And so, you know, yeah, we, we've, we've really tried to say, you know, this frequency of behavior is new, uh, it it's, uh, surpasses all other behaviors on, on phones, and so it means we can try to experiment with new but things. But you also have Snap Cash, uh, you have, and you have, and you, and you have these other things. And if you, if you look at something like WeChat, in, in, you know, in China, or Line, or any of these things, they just keep adding these things. Are you expecting to keep adding extensions of beyond built off messaging? Yeah, so I think like focus and simplicity are, are really important to us. Um, and so I really, I don't know yet because I think we'd only want to expand into different products and services that we feel like we can do really, really well. Um, I think you can probably see like we, we don't necessarily care about being the first, but we want to be the first to get it right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we, we really try to take time, you know, rather than just diving into a ton of different services. So while we could drive a lot of distribution to lots of different uh, application services, we want to make sure that we kind of we're thoughtful and deliberate with, with how we do that. So let's talk about in that in two things, the discover feature that you're offering to publishers. You are doing a lot of things to be publisher friendly. All kinds of other companies, Facebook is trying to do that. Google presumably is trying to do that. What, they're not. They're I'm in having, charge of Google's project. Uh, okay, good. Um, but how do you look at that? What, do you, what are you doing there? Are you trying to see, because when you're creating your own stories and then also, are you, do you imagine competing with the publishers or helping the publishers? What are you for, to them? You know, my team might hate me for saying this, but we probably don't come anywhere close to any of our partners because we're just not that good uh, mm -hmm. at it yet. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, when we, when we started out building Discover, what we did is we went around and talked to a bunch of people that create mm -hmm. media, so publishers and editors and writers, and we talked about what worked for them and, and what didn't. Uh, but the challenge is that that was like insanely time consuming. And so we realized that if we wanted to make a lot of rapid progress in order to really like walk in a publisher's shoes, we needed to try and do it ourselves. Okay. And so now rather than like traveling to New York or something like that, to talk to a lot of these really big publishers, I can go across the street and say like, hey, like what's not working, <laughs> right? Um, and we can try and get better faster. And do you imagine doing more publisher deals like that? And, and, and what you're, are you trying to help them, or do you feel that they're your constituents or not? I, you know, cer cer certainly we are trying to help them. We build a product for them, um, you know, uh, so, and, and obviously for our customer. So in that sense, yeah, we're, we're definitely trying to help. So there's, a, there's like a blizzard of metrics that uh, social sites and messaging sites put out there. Um, it sometimes is really hard to, to parse them. You've been, you haven't said a lot about your, your metrics. How do you measure uh, kind of, you know, the frequency with which people use Snapchat, the, the loyalty, the stickiness of it? Can you talk about that? Yeah. This is definitely a challenge for our industry in general because metrics like monthly active user and daily active user haven't been standardized. Um, and so it can be really hard to compare different businesses and the way they're, they're measuring uh, metrics like that. Um, but more importantly than even the standardization is that they really fail to capture the depth of engagement for, for a user that's active. Um, so for example, for us, while we're approaching you know, 100 million daily active users in developed markets, um, the thing that's most exciting and most interesting is that 65% of those daily active users are creating content every day. So that's an indicator of wow. engagement. And I guess uh, the, the CEO of Vodafone recently said that 75% of the upload traffic in the United Kingdom is Snapchat. <laughs> so, wow. so that gives you some sense of the investment that Snapchatters are making so, in our, in our So how does that, I mean, do you have any way to, to help with context to compare? I'm not asking you to tear down anyone else. I want to make that Clear, but just for context, what percent of I don't know Facebook users actually or Twitter users actually create content? 
as far as you know? I have no idea. You have no Sorry. idea. Okay. But we, this daily active users, this is 100 million daily active users you have now. Approaching 100 million in developed markets. Okay. It, meaning the United States and places Europe, like that. Et um, and you don't, but you don't want to use the monthly active users anymore. This is, the, do you think, why do you think daily active users is what you want to use? You know, internally we even use hourly active. Okay. Because right. <laughs> people use their phones all the time. Mm -hmm. so. so monthly is just, <laughs> You don't. You think it's much less meaningful. Uh, you know, I think especially with uh, the prevalence of mobile phones and how frequently we all use our phones, uh, that's certainly how we view it in our business. So let's talk about the product, how it's evolving. It, as you said, it started off as a camera product and it moved to other things. Some people, uh, do you think it's easy to use? Do you think you're, you've reached a level of simplicity? It's certainly more easier to use than a lot of other services. But how do you look at what you want to do and what kind of audiences you want to attract to it? Because you want to grow these daily active users or hourly ones. Well, I think it's our imperative to always make it easier. Um, and so we're always trying to take things away, like fewer screens, fewer buttons, things like that. That's why it's, you know, at its core, it's really three screens. Um, but I think one of the, one of the things that that we've had to had to deal with is that you know the service fundamentally is new, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it's not re it doesn't really borrow from the desktop paradigms, and so I think um, it, it, there's a, there's a bit of a learning curve, but that's kind of what makes it fun. You know? What do you want to change? Is there things around it that you want to change? The there are so many things. The push we want to change. and <laughs> can you give us an example? Um, you know, gosh. One of, the, one of the sort of contentious issues that we've been thinking through in, in our business uh, is, is really this press and hold mechanic. So in order to view a video on our service, you have to literally put your finger on the screen the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously for us, that's been a huge like, sign of engagement, right? You have to really be holding your phone and, and holding your thumb on it. But it's, I, th I think for us, holding us back from longer uh, pieces of, of content, video, longer videos being viewed on our service, it's just, it's just kind of annoying to hold your finger there mm -hmm. that long. And, and I guess the backstory of that too is that the only reason why you have to hold your finger is that because um, when we first built this service, there was no way to detect screenshots. There was no screenshot API built into the iPhone. And so we kind of had a tricky way of doing it that involved holding your finger on the screen. Um, and now obviously there's a screenshot API. And so I think there's, there's a question internally about, you know, okay, like can I stop holding the screen all the time? <laughs> so can you, are you gonna do that? Uh, I guess that, that uh, we, we try not to ruin surprises, but that, that may be in the cards. You just said it. Tim. Yeah, I think maybe. <laughs> you, see, you see them, right? Yeah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> and they all have Snapchat, so it's like out. <laughs> um, Before you get to that, live streaming. Periscope, we're going to have Dick Coslow talk about and, and Kayvon talk about it. How do you look at that? Are you developing it? There's rumors that you've been de developing a live streaming product. Uh, there's rumors of you developing everything, pretty much, but that one is, seems to be right in your wheelhouse. Is that something you want to do, or do you feel that there are copyright issues or two? Uh, for us, um, that's something where we're just watching and learning. You know, obviously, uh, Dick and, and his team, they're paving the way. Um, so we're just gonna, we're gonna wait and see uh, what sticks and, and kind of take it from there, but we're not working on anything right now. Are you worried about the copyright issues around it? Um, you know, not really. We when we produce live stories, live events that we share with our community, we work with the rights holders to uh, to, to produce those. So your demographic skew is quite young, if I'm not mistaken, right? And is that good enough for you? Um, you want to serve that demographic, and you, and you keep adding features. They obviously respond really well because of the we can see it in the growth you you you've had. But there's a lot of other people out there who've uh, been able to migrate to, to things that started out primarily for college students or younger people, whatever. Does that interest you at all? And if so, what would you do to attract other demographics? So we're much more interested in increasing engagement uh, rather than getting big. <laughs> so we've really focused on a few markets that are really, really important to us. And right now we're working on really increasing engagement, making, making sure the people that are on our service just love it. Um, and that's really what we watch. And I, and I think over time, um, we'll, we'll think about expanding the product. But right now, it's, it's really just a maniacal focus on making great products and, and deepening the engagement with our service. So let's talk a little bit about where you're headed next where you're headed next. You're obviously raised a lot of money. Um, you, there's all kinds of people interested in, in Snapchat. You operate away from Silicon Valley. 
Um, let's actually let's talk about that first. What is it like not being? What is your viewpoint of Silicon Valley? Because you definitely you are the company of Los Angeles. You are separate. You're different. I know you have some thoughts about the place and not being there. Well, it's sort of funny because the business did start there. So I think there's definitely an awareness of, of Silicon Valley and how you know transformational uh, obviously it's been. Um, we love LA. Our office is on the beach, and that's pretty nice. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, and you know, frank, frankly, for us, it's just nice to get to get a little space um, from from everything going on there, so that we can really focus on on our our business. Do you have thoughts about what's going on up there? Do you fin think it's too uh, frenzied, or or do you like it or not like it? It's absolutely incredible. I mean, it's it's sometimes <laughs> overwhelming for me to visit there. It's it's there's a lot of stuff going on. It's and it's really exciting, but we kind of enjoy the the LA lifestyle. Can we talk a little bit about the broader landscape of this phenomenal last 10 years of upsurge in uh, services and apps and uh, uh, the whole area of social engagement, which you're, you're, you're in. You just talked about how, how much how, how you really got passionate about that engagement thing. So being social and being engaged are two really important things. And, how do you look at the whole landscape of what's out there? You have a, some, you have giant Facebook, which has, uh, I'm sure, also wants people to be. I know they want people to be more engaged, and and they also want to grow and they want to try different things, including content. You have uh, Twitter doing some some of its own things, and then you have a bunch of you have a bunch of other things. How do you look at the whole landscape? I'm at. Yeah. I'm not asking you to run down yeah, every yeah. competitor, but so so for us, when we look at social media, we really look at it on a continuum, and the continuum is from accumulation to instant expression, right? And I think the fascinating thing, and I mean, I guess let's just trip down memory lane. You know, seven, ten years ago, you take a bunch of photos with your camera at a party, and you run home, and maybe the next day you you plug in your camera and you upload your photos to the internet, and, and friends can look at them. That's really, I mean, that's really the accumulation model, this, you right? Know. Um, and the fascinating, exciting thing about our business is that um, mobile phones have unlocked the ability you know, to instantly express yourself. And we think that the products, obviously, that, that we're working on, that the industry is working on, fall somewhere on this continuum. So for us, you know, snaps really were about the core product, really about instant expression. Stories you know, shifted us a little bit further towards accumulation. You know, and of course, you can always save you know, a snap sent on our service, um, and that kind of puts us sort of in the middle of, of uh, this accumulation to uh, instant expression continuum, with the default always being uh, instant expression. So where would you put Twitter and Facebook on that uh, spectrum? Um, I think Facebook has always really biased itself towards, uh, towards accumulation. And I think Twitter is, is uh, maybe somewhere more in the middle. Uh, you know. They were pretty instant a few hours ago when the news about our deal came out. But, but, so. but in terms of, but when you talk about accumulation, which sounds like some disease, um, uh, <laughs> is that the way of the future? I mean, talk more broadly, because how do you look at a Facebook? Because some people can, like, again, with my kids, they're not on Facebook. They are on Snapchat. And I'm not sure why they're not. Maybe they're not old enough, or they haven't gotten there. Um, but they're not accumulating. They're, you, they're using it a wholly different way. And it's sort of an, it's like an, it feels like an anti-Facebook. And, and, and I don't, again, I don't want to set you up, but they were interested in buying you. You declined, apparently. Um, but how do you look at the difference of them evol between you and, and uh, Facebook? Well, you know, I think we can sort of take this back even to like 18 months ago. Right. You know, we had, we had sending snaps back and forth. We had barely launched stories. I mean, nobody was using it. Right. <laughs> um, and you know, since then, we've we've launched chat and we've launched uh, live video and Discover, et cetera. So, um, it's it's a tough question to ask because our business has really changed rapidly in the in the in the past 18 months. Um, but, I, but again, I, I think that it, it's not really oppositional. It's, it's more philosophical. And, and it really has to do with you know, where, where we build products on, on the continuum. And, and for us, we want to have the capacity to build products all along that continuum, because we think it's, that, that's important. And that's you know, the choice people make when they express themselves. Do you, do you imagine that, uh, now, Kara just said her kids don't use Facebook, and they use Snapchat. Um, but do you think uh, there are, it, is the typical case like Kara's kids, or are there a lot of other people who 
also use Facebook, also use Twitter, also use something else, but they love Snapchat also. Well, the nice thing is all these products are free, so. <laughs> yeah. For now, uh, for, for today. But, but when you look at this idea of what, what you are, you we're talking about ephemeral mess. What would you call yourself then if you're talking about, because what we always do, what do we call these companies as they evolve? So we've been, we called you ephemeral messaging service, Snapchat, comma, the Los Angeles-based ephemeral messaging service. It's really impossible to call you that now, although you are that. You have that as among your attributes. What would you call yourself? Uh, I think it, we think, call it entertainment. Okay. <laughs> entertainment. Entertainment. Interesting. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> okay, but nothing. But inter, this is some people entertaining each other through various means. Yeah, I think some of it could be just the snaps themselves. Yeah, the snaps are. It's just entertaining to to take a picture and add your little caption and stuff. It's fun. So let's talk uh, a little bit about the. You, you've had some really interesting things to say about the bubble and about the valuations and about the the market. Um, I could go over them, but sort of how do you look at this market right now, what's happening? Because a lot of people, they go, it's a constant debate that, by the way, that black um, thing outside, that's the bubble um, when you walk in. When, um, how many people have seen it and thought, you'll see, that's the tech bubble? That's the tech bubble. Um, that's what it is. What, how, do you, how do you look at the whole market right now? Because you're, you're caught up into it. So, so I think um, it, it's the result of uh, easy money policy effectively. So when you have near zero interest rates or negative rates in some countries and you've printed, a, governments have printed a lot of money, um, you know, I think uh, that people are, are uh, making riskier investments. Um, and I, I, I think there will be a correction. Um, it, it's a question of when. I think everyone sort of has uh, thoughts about that. Uh, we, we don't know when, but it's definitely something that we factor into our plans as we think about the growth of our business. When do you think that? <laughs> uh, well, if I knew for sure, I'd make a lot of money, but uh, it's probably better to skip that. <laughs> All right. Um, let me ask you about an another uh, uh, controversial but super important issue, which has to do with diversity and, and gender in tech. Um, and this year here at the conference, we're going to be asking this of, of all our speakers. Um, so we're not singling anyone out, but <clears throat> we'd love to hear what your, what your diversity situation is at Snapchat and what you think it ought to be and what you think about the whole industry and why we are where we are. Diversity for us is really closely tied to competency. So for us, we have such a diverse group of people using our products and services every day that in order for us to make absolutely great products and services uh, for that community, we need a really, really diverse group of people. Uh, and it's really that simple. Um, so for us, we just have an awareness that you know, if we want to make the best products, we need to have, we need to have a diverse group. So can you describe your diverse group of people? And I mean, what are, what are some of the percentages, if you have them? And I, Again, like this, this is sort of the challenge, and I should, I should have exact percentages for you, but we just don't think about diversity in, in terms of numbers that way. And I think one of the perks of being a really small company is that from the beginning, we got to think about diversity. So we didn't end up with a situation where 10 years down the line, oh my gosh, I need to fix my numbers. Because it's not really cool to think about people as numbers, right? Um, we think about people and diverse skill sets. And so for us, because you know we're 300 people now, we were 30 people gosh, a year and a half ago, we've been really mindful that as we grow, we need to hire diverse folks. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure we'll have specific numbers to share at some point, but it's been a part of our growth. And what, what about my, the other part of my question, which was, why do you think there is this problem in tech generally, and particularly in the, in the management levels of tech? Is there something special gosh. about tech that makes this a particular challenge? I think diversity is a challenge everywhere, uh, you know. Right, but but in tech in particular, I, I think I'm kind of saying that diversity is a challenge everywhere, in, in including tech, and you know, that's, that's kind of that. So there's nothing different or special about the problem in in tech. I mean, that the whole society has the problem. In. Um, I there there's so many things that feed into diversity and inequality, um, that like unpacking them on the stage is probably not, not the best use of time. But I, I, I think I, I really do. a good use of time. 
<laughs> um, no, it's, it's, it's really important work. But, um, but no, I, I think that you know, diversity is a challenge for everyone. We need to say that it's a challenge for everyone. Um, I, I don't think tech has some special thing that, that makes it harder. You know, I think it just takes hard work uh, to build a diverse group of people to build great products. OK. So let's talk about you, a little bit about you. And actually, like, before that, we'll get to products. Again, when you're, when you're in the product area you're in, how do you, you can't go out many years, but music. Do you, are you going to be offering a music product? Uh, again, we don't make a habit of ruining surprises, but well, I can talk a little bit. Yeah, I can talk a little bit on, about uh, music because it's something we love. So, I, um, I guess people who work in our office will tell you I, I blast music a lot. Um, but for us, when we look at the music industry today, a lot of the conversation about music is really about uh, business model and distribution. So, the, the transition from a transaction-based model to uh, a, subs a subscription-based model, cloud versus download. I, th those are really what I'm, I'm hearing about the industry, and I. I think for us, we always try to apply the, the product perspective. Like, what, what really do people want from music? Uh, what's, a, what's, the, what's a great album? Like, what makes a great album? And so, uh, so we're really approaching music from, you know, is there some, some music product that's better than a track listing? Like, there's got to be. <laughs> um, and I think that's something that we'd be interested in working on. But it's just not as simple for us as, like, a distribution, uh, a distribution plan. So you know, just not a subscription service, or when you're saying, is there something better? What, give me a bigger conceptual uh, idea. Yeah, so um, I guess kind of my point is that everyone thinks of me online music today as a track listing. I mean, really, a list of text. That's, right. that's music today. Um, Sometimes little pictures. Li tiny, tiny picture, <laughs> like postage stamp. Um, and and we're, we're sort of saying, you know, can, can there be a, a, a richer music experience? I, Probably, I think a lot of people are, are working on making it better, but, but we'd want to focus on, on actually what is the experience of listening to music beyond how do I get it, which is, I think, a different problem. And does that play into your whole desire for more engagement? You know, it's funny you say that because music is actually, I guess, the second highest frequency behavior on mobile phones, listening to music. Um, so, so that would make yeah. a lot of sense. I mean, you're running your whole product on basically a music player. A thing that happens to be a music player, and many other things, but one of the things that is the music. And when you call what you're doing entertainment, it, it, it sounds like you're building a club. I mean, I, it sounds, you know what I mean? Like, I'm trying to think you have music, you have people chit chatting, a little dating going on. Um, do, you, do you think of it that way? Like, Snapchat's a club, or what is it? A um, club I would not be invited into. But still. And are there bouncers? Right. Yeah. Well, you have to be over 13. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, we don't think about it as, as a club. We think about it as a community, uh, really, of people. Um, and, and we're there to serve that community. That's our job. So last question on the product thing. Where is mobile going to develop? You have been on the mobile phone. You look at you. You're, it's where your entire business is. Um, how, where do you imagine it going? Where, when you're thinking, OK, this is gonna, my product isn't going to develop just the way Facebook got into trouble on the website and they had to move quickly over to mobile. What is something that keeps you up at night when you're thinking of your product? Is it VR? Is it glasses? Is it this watch? Not this. He's got one, but I don't. <laughs> well, I mean, is there a practical way to do it on something like this watch? We, so we thought actually a lot about making Snapchat for the watch and, you know, sort of like, you know, would it, why, why would you want to look at a tiny picture instead of just looking at the, the bigger picture on your phone? Um, so we, we ended up waiting to develop something, because I think it's going to have to be a totally unique experience. It's not something that exists in our service yet. And we you know, didn't want to just port over some core element of Snapchat to the I watch. think that's a really smart statement, if right. you don't mind me saying so. Right. Right. So just... when, when you're doing so, that, but, but, where do you go? Where do you, where do you think is going to be the next platform for Snapchat? Or is it just the phone? Um, I think the focus right now for us is just evolving those three businesses, right? So cameras, are there more ways to capture things and express yourself, right? Communication, what are the new ways, to, are, there, are there new ways to communicate? It's sort of wild to me that, you know, the phone still like rings, you know, like okay. it, there's just kind of some of these, these concepts we've, we've pulled over from the way we've used phones. Your issue time. with ringing is what? It's kind of, it's kind of annoying. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so it, it was like that before too. So, it was <laughs> so instead of ringing, what would it do? Just like give you a shock to the brain, or what? <laughs> How would you alert me? Now this this thing does a different thing, right? It taps you. 
Some people like it, some people probably don't like it, but it, it, are you, is Snapchat gonna start? We haven't, we haven't totally sorted that out yet, and we wanna nail well, it. Is lightning gonna come but, out of the phone when there's a... Um, that'd be cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, if you use that, I get a, piece of, a lightning idea. Um, yeah, so I, look, I, I think like it, there's, just, there's just a lot of examples, and for us, like, you know, the, I, and I guess kind of on the last piece, the content piece, like the live stories product is like just at the very, very, very beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that to us is like super, I'm like, I mean, I'm like obsessed with it. Um, so that is an area for us that's just ripe with innovation. So I think for us, it's more, again, a couple years into the business, three core components of the business, let's methodically evolve those components uh, rather than trying, we're, we're not really sort of a like, what's the new hot thing uh, right. kind of company. But I think I heard you say, and please tell me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, plenty of people do. Um, I think I heard you say that if you can develop something that is rich and unique on here, you'll probably do that. So let's talk about you again. We'll get back to you. I know you love talking about you, but when we had lunch for the first time, he screamed at me for about at least 20 minutes about something I was actually wrong about, um, about privacy. It's a big issue for you. Um, and, uh, and then we started talking about bigger ideas. And one of the things that I think is difficult with you is it's really to understand how you look at yourself as, as a manager, as you're growing into a CEO. You know, every one of these CEOs, whether it's Jobs or Zuckerberg or whoever, has a different journey. You're, how old are you now? Uh, 24. 24, okay. Um, how do you look at yourself? I mean, are you, are you a sole proprietor? Are you uh, someone that likes a team? Do you, are you a, a Jobsian or whatever? I don't know, what would it be a Gatesian? Jobsian, Gatesian, Zuckerbergian, Zuckerberg. or are you just some? Some Dude. guy, yeah. Some guy. <laughs> um, Probably just some guy. Uh, I think some guys again. Okay. I, I don't mean are you like as famous as them or as rich as them. I mean you know philosophically in the way that you go about your job. I think the interesting thing, right? You, you mentioned manager. I, I'm I'm not a great manager. I try to be a great leader. Um, and for me, that's been going through a process of not like how to be a great CEO, but how to be a great Evan. <laughs> um, and that really has been the challenge. I think in the, like when I was younger, I grew up with this sort of idea of like what a CEO. Is. Which and, was? Uh, you know, wear a suit and something like that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, but, but sort of a lot of traditional ideas about what an executive is. And I, I, I had, I think, to go through a process where I, I've been trying to figure out like, what, what makes me a better asset for our, our team. Um, and I think the key thing there and all that is just trying to grow as quickly as possible. So again, you know, I probably can't say this enough, but we're in a business that is growing really, really quickly and at the same time evolving and changing really, really quickly. And so f for me, the, the mandate is just grow as fast as humanly possible uh, to accommodate the, the changing environment and then find absolutely astounding people um, that are kind of on board to go uh, where we want to go and, and really give them the autonomy to, to build businesses. Well, what kind of leader are you? How would you character, if you weren't describing yourself and you were being honest with yourself? I'm a fascist, for example. But <laughs> I'm a benevolent fascist, but a fascist nonetheless. Um, so I think, I think our team would say like, that I'm very decisive, but I change my mind a lot. Right, <laughs> which is sort of sort of a sort of a unique com combination. Um, but it, it really means like we, we care about making decisions really really quickly, but we care about the flexibility to to change your mind, and and we want to make sure that is a key component uh, sort of of our business. So, you know, someone on our team would be like, give him six hours, <laughs> and you'll change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we, we you know Tim, when the first time Tim Cook came here, he said that. That's what people didn't understand about Jobs, that he would make these you know, big decisions and it would seem like the end of the argument and then he'd come in the next morning and <laughs> flip on it. What, um, who do you admire? Who do you, do, you, do you try to pattern yourself after anybody or not at all? I really admire Edwin Land, um, who founded Polaroid, because he, he sort of had three really special gifts, I guess. Uh, he was a great scientist. He like really cared about science and about experimentation and would work like endless hours experimenting. Um, he cared about art, uh, you know, 
significant Polaroid, um, and, and kind of worked in service of art. But then also, um, <laughs> also was like a great countryman and like, uh, and humanist and made decisions based on, you know, what he believed the right thing to do was for, you know, the right thing to do for humanity. Um, so I'm trying to read kind of as much as I can about him right now. Okay. Anybody else? Like my mom. <laughs> um, <Sure. laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, there's, there are a ton, a, a ton of folks, uh, in all sorts of industries really. Um, you know, there's one, we were working on our, on our, uh, customer service, right? And like tech companies, I think, are just historically just atrocious at customer service. And so we, we want to get, get better at it. Um, and we've, we try to talk to people that are sort of in extreme situations that know a lot about something. And so in this case, um, you know, we, we talked to some folks who run the customer service at Penske Trucking. And when you break down an ice storm and you're carrying a bunch of fresh food um, and you're really irritated, you call Penske Trucking's help center and they help you. And so for us, that's an example of like someone in our world, Greg Penske in our world, uh, who is an incredible role model because the way that they run customer service in their business is outstanding. Um, and they were really generous enough to like actually talk to us about it. You know? mm -hmm. So uh, I'm just gonna stick on you. What's misunderstood about you? Because sometimes when you read stories about you, and there's a lot of them, there's a lot of them, you get this dude thing going on, this LA guy kind of thing. Um, whiff of arrogance, what's, what's wrong in what's been written about you? Here's your chance to say, this is what I'm not like. What do you think gets wrong, or, or maybe they're completely right? You are the LA dude. <laughs> no, you're not. Um, like everyone's entitled to their own perception of me. Um, but I, again, I just try really hard to be me. And like sometimes that means that I'm unfiltered or like I use a curse word or something. Um, even I admire that in a person, but go ahead. What? Curse words, but go ahead, move yeah, along. I don't know. So yeah, I, you know, I, I try to like give people like myself because I, I think like making a great product is like being in touch with how you feel about things and you know, being able to express that. And so sometimes like, you know, like I'm unfiltered, but that's just me, you know, I guess, so. Okay. Well. Do you imagine that as you, as you keep going with this project and you're not 24, you're 34, mm -hmm. that you'll filter, it will have to filter yourself more or is that, would that be detrimental to your leadership style? Gosh, I hope I mature a little bit. Um, <laughs> uh, who knows, you know, like I, tomorrow I'm gonna change and the day after I'm gonna change. So I, I, I'm not really sure how I'm gonna grow and, and what I'm, what I'm going to be like when I'm 34, but I, I, I really hope that I can stay in touch with like really genuinely how I feel about things, and that I'm not afraid to express that. Yeah. Does, does it matter to you uh, that there be an exit for your business? Because uh, everything you've said here has really been about building the business and engaging with the customer, which I, I personally love to hear that. But I mean, obviously, there are lots of tech-oriented businesses that are looking for exits. So does yeah, it matter that, to you? That really matters. Um, you know, we need to IPO. Uh, we have a plan to do that. Um, obviously, can't give you too much color there, but uh, How about a little, what a plan to, to IPO by? Again, can't, <laughs> can't yeah. give you color there, but, All right. but yes. What, do you look, what does an IPO look like for you? Like, you have revenues, you have, what is the, what is the? Uh, an IPO looks like a lot of things, but most importantly, it looks like just another another dot kind of uh, in, in the growth of our business. Um, you know, I, we don't view that as like the end, really. That's, that's just the beginning. Right. But an IPO is your goal, is, your, is one of them. I don't mean the final goal, but a goal along the way. I mean, we started talking about exits, and I, you know, right. that's, an IPO right. is really important. Right. Do you ever imagine entertaining another acquisition offer? Or maybe you're entertaining one right now. I have no idea. No. You want to stay? Independent. Yeah, it's more fun that way. Okay. <laughs> and if there's anything that you would like to change about what you've done until now, although you're just 24, so really you should have nothing, um, <laughs> uh, what would it be? Uh, there's like 10 billion things, probably. Um, one of the things I'm trying to get better at is like apologizing faster uh, okay. when I make mistakes. So that's a big. That's been a big priority of mine. Okay. Yeah. What would you apologize for? 
<laughs> oh, man. Um, my mom's probably like cringing somewhere. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think like in definitely throughout the growth of, of our business, like we've, we've made mistakes and, you know, we haven't like lived up to the promises that we've made to Snapchatters. And every time we do that, we try to apologize and make it right and, mm -hmm. and put the focus on the things we're doing to, uh, to build our business and make sure we don't do it again. And the last question before we get to uh, people in the audience. I did apologize to you about something I said on the air in privacy. Talk very briefly about privacy. It's a big issue. You, you have a lot of thoughts on this issue. Where is it going? I mean, ephemeral messaging was attractive to people because it wasn't there forever. What, where are we right now on the issue of privacy? Privacy is very precious, period, for us. Um, and kind of what does that mean, right? Privacy means a lot of things to different people, but I think at its core, privacy really is about comfort. Um, and so when you are with, uh, you know, you're with a loved one and you're like, hey, uh, let's sit down and have a serious conversation. There's something really important I want to tell you. And you close the door and, you know, your loved one like pulls out a pad of paper uh, and like a tape recorder. <laughs> um, you sort of you sort of lose that intimacy that really helps you build the relationship. And so yeah. for us, like <laughs> privacy is very, very, very precious and and beyond that it's it really serves you know it's it serves as a as a comforting thing and in a way to build relationships with people and is there privacy on the internet or can there be you know the nature of privacy obviously is really changed and so it's a it's a tough definition i think most most folks now are really trying to restore context as a start which means if i want to show you something like I really just want to show you something, or if I want to show you and Walt, that, that I should be able to choose just to show two people and not everybody on the internet. Um, and I think, I, think that's an on, I think that's an ongoing effort. And is that something you're going to be pushing more of as you add these other layers into Snapchat? We, we try to do it just in our send to screen alone, where you, know, you can pick your mom or your best friend um, or you know, every, everyone on Snapchat or public, ev everyone. Uh, Everyone. So we try to we try to definitely give um, give you the ability to add context to your communications. I think that's that's just one sort of step, uh, you know, one sort of step in, in making sure that people really you know appreciate privacy because I think our understanding of it has changed. Okay. All right, let's get some Question. questions from our attendees. Just stand up to the mic. Why don't we start on the left here? Yeah, hi. Um, enjoying the discussion, Evan. Greg Tarr, question for you around the monetization and business model a little bit. Can you talk a little bit about uh, video ads and how you see that playing out versus other ads and, and how you'll maintain uh, you know, some relevancy for the Snapchatters with the video ads? Sure. Uh, video ads are really important to our business. We have a great uh, unit we call 3V, so it's vertical video views. Uh, really, really simple. The vertical actually, uh, sounds very obvious, but I think we're the first folks to cut video vertically the way that you hold your phone. <laughs> um, and you don't have to turn it. You don't have to turn it. It's very simple, but it actually means that people complete those videos nine times more than the horizontal, the little horizontal videos you see that are kind of like a postage stamp on your screen. Um, so that, that's been really great. And, you know, of course, they're full screen and, and video. Um, so that's been... Uh, great for us. Um, you know, right now, uh, obviously, we're selling that video product against audience, but also affiliation, whether that's uh, a media brand or a live event. Um, and again, early days, a couple months in, uh, but the results so far have been promising. Over here. Uh, Evan, uh, Mark Mahaney at RBC. Uh, you talked about trying to develop um, leadership skills. There were a lot of management turnover earlier this year. Just put some context around that for us. Did the right people leave? Are you bringing in the right people? Are those moves that you think you learned valuable lessons from? Thanks. So I should, I should preface this by saying that every single one of those executives is absolutely terrific. Um, and for us, it really comes down to a question of fit. So coming back to the nature of our business, highly unusual, really rapid growth, and also rapidly evolving, um, it, and, and sort of what fit means to us, which is you know, the right person, the right responsibilities at the right time. Um, and the challenge is when a business is changing so fast, the fit can change uh, as well. And so I think there are, there are a few circumstances where you know, we've, we've both agreed that, hey, it, it just wasn't the right fit anymore. Um, but, is uh, it because of you or the changing nature of the business? Is it just what you, what you need or? Um, Look, Mark Zuckerberg had like 90 CFOs. I kept writing stories about it for a while there until he settled on, I mean, Cheryl. 
Cheryl was the first time they didn't move the law. Yeah, I mean, you could absolutely add the team to like a, a definition of fit, um, 100%. And so I, as the team changes, and uh, then I, I think that, um, that factors into it as well. Are you looking for a partner like Cheryl and Mark or something like that? Are you, are you, do you think you need one to be successful? I have a great partner named Bobby. <laughs> right, your founder, yeah. of course. Who started the business with me. Um, so I'm really grateful for, for him. And the two of you make all decisions together. Uh, yeah, I, th I think we make decisions independently too. But you know, again, it's just really great to have a partner in, in your business. Right. Back to the attendees. Um, you talked about an IPO being an important uh, business, being important. Is, is advertising enough as a revenue generator to build the kind of business you want Snapchat to be? Or do there need to be other sources of revenue, whether it's subscription or transactional or something else? We believe that great businesses have multiple sources of revenue. And so as we kind of talked about our three, the three components of our business, the camera communications and content, we're, we're early days monetizing the content part of our business with advertising. You can imagine that other, uh, other modes of monetization would lend themselves more naturally to our other products. Um, and so we'll be, we'll be, we are, <laughs> I should say, we are uh, developing those uh, as well. Thanks, John. Terry? Yeah, so uh, as Walt mentioned, you have a very, very large audience, but it skews uh, very young. Uh, how would you summarize your value proposition for those users over 30? And um, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> um, I was asking for him, and then he's asking for a friend. So, so I think probably the, the most fun way to start using Snapchat is like starting with the basics. Um, and I think people can really underestimate how much fun it is to just take a photo or video and then draw on it or add a caption. It's, it's just a fun and really quick way to express yourself. And when you start kind of doing that, you, you realize that other, uh, there, there really aren't any other media products that allow you to just edit your videos on the fly and send them to friends. Um, and doing that just gives a lot, uh, you know, it makes it more fun, obviously, but gives more context to kind of this, the stories that you're telling. And then, I guess I said stories, but the, the other product uh, that people then kind of transition to is the story product. And it's a really, for, for what we've seen, it's a really great way to like watch how your kid's day is going, if you're traveling, um, or a friend of mine even makes little stories uh, for his son, if he's traveling, makes little stories for his son to watch before bed. Um, there's kind of a good example, you know, where, where he asks his son sort of, what do you want to see today? And the son's like a fire truck and a plane and, and kind of over the course of traveling, um, his dad will piece together this really cute sort of story um, that the son can watch before bedtime. And so I think in that sense, it, it helps family members feel close because they can sort of share this moment together. And then they could go on, sorry, to other things, watching or consuming. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right now, you've got hundreds, if not thousands, of brands that are making use of the Stories feature. You completely lack any kind of tools that a mature system like Facebook or Twitter will have where people can easily be followed outside of the ghost or need to see what's going on with their engagement without having to literally count each and individual person that's happening. Is that going to change? And, and also related to that, do you anticipate going to any kind of a self-serve advertising model or doing something beyond just deals with a very small select group of media companies? So to, to answer both of your questions, and I'll kind of expand them. Um, philosophically, uh, it's, it's really important to us that Snapchat is built for people, not, not for brands, um, and that we believe that people and brands are different. And so sometimes it's even frustrating for us when brands come on our service and like try to act like a person, because um, <laughs> they're not people. Um, so we haven't made it easier for brands to act like people. Has anybody just... done a good job with that? Just curious that you've seen. You know, I don't add, I don't add them, so I Correct. should I should probably have a great example, but I don't. Um, I don't. I, I know that there's a lot of creative stuff going on, but but it's just something that bugs us because we think brands and people are different. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll evolve some tools, but you know, more likely we'll we'll make it easier for brands to be brands. I would I would say, and part of that will be uh, obviously self-serve advertising. Okay. I would like to get your perspective. First time innovation versus ongoing innovation. Can you share some best practices and differences between those two? And how do you go about um, building an organization which is also involved in ongoing innovation, especially in view of the competition? Well, I absolutely adore you for asking that question, because um, this is what I try to talk to our 
team about all the time, um, which is this idea that you know really our job is to make amazing things that people like repeatedly, and the repeatedly part is really the tough the tough part. Um, we do a lot of things to try uh, and innovate repeatedly. Most of it uh, starts with empathy, like really listening to how other people feel about their life and things that they're using, and then also listening to ourselves when we're using products and we're annoyed by them or, or whatever. Um, and so I, I think the core really is empathy. Um, Obviously, hard work, big, big part of that too, because we throw out a zillion, a zillion concepts before we find one that's that's half that's half decent. Um, and I, I think the other thing for us that that we try to do is we try to build from a point of view. We try to build from values um, because that that allows you to to sustain the innovation. Um, if you're always kind of evolving your product based on the core values on, on, upon which you built it, for example, Discover is really about the editorial perspective. Stories is uh, you know, focused on chronological order. That's something that's really important to us. If, if you, if you uh, innovate from these core values about how you believe the product should behave, they, they tend to have a longer uh, life, lifespan. These last two right here. Yeah, hi, thank you. And I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Walt and Kara for making diversity one of the themes of the uh, conference, because I think it's actually an incredibly important subject. And we think so too. Thank you. And when, when I think of diversity, I, I focus obviously on diversity as it involves women. And, you know, I'm sure you're not the only guy in this room to have said, thought, or emailed the kinds of emails that came out. And I'm just wondering what role that thought stream plays in the, you know, the hiring, promotion, and retention of women in Silicon Valley. So, I guess for everyone here, I sent inappropriate emails uh, in, in my fraternity in college. Uh, obviously, very embarrassing. Uh, and you know, I'm really sorry for anyone uh, that I offended. Um, I think, generally speaking, that the, the people who come to work at Snapchat believe in personal growth. Right? It's, really, it's really something that our, our company celebrates. It's part of why uh, you know, Snapchat stories are ephemeral because you're, you will be a different person tomorrow. And so I think optimistically, uh, you know, people in our organization believe that like progress is important, that people can make progress. Um, and, and so in that sense, I think, um, I think it's, I think if it's, you know, attracted folks that, that believe that to, to our business. Uh, Rolf Winkler from the Wall Street Journal, thanks for taking the question. Uh, messaging is where a lot of the engagement, basically most of the engagement is with Snapchat, uh, and advertisers probably want to be where all the engagement is. 15 billion is a big valuation to grow into. Will you put advertising uh, with the messaging portion of Snapchat? So you probably wouldn't believe this, but people are watching a lot more stories than they are snaps every day. Um, and that actually makes it, it really lends itself uh, to that sort of advertising. We, we don't want to put ads in communication just because it's sort of rude. You know, it's kind of like, get out of here, we're talking. Um, so so we, we won't do that, um, but you know, there's a massive opportunity around uh, our content products. Okay. Thank you Thank so you, much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you.